Pen and the Seal, a quest for the Lost Ark of the Covenant, which focused on Ethiopia and which was published in 1992. And since then, I've been, I have been writing uh, non-fiction books uh, about historical mysteries, particularly, uh, particularly the possibility that we have lost a whole episode of human civilization, that, we've, um, that there's a great lost civilization lurking in our past, which historians and archaeologists haven't yet recognized. That's been a very important theme for me. But in recent years, I've also written some novels as well, uh, novels about uh, historical mysteries also. Now, at the core of, of this tale, and this goes back, obviously, to your previous book as well, are these stories from mankind's past, these common stories that are encased in myth and quite often, as such, are dismissed as, uh, you know, flights of imagination, I don't know quite what, interpretive stories, but the, a common thread running through is the story of a deluge, for example. Uh, the, yes. The best known example will be the biblical flood that everyone yes. will know about. We also have tales of fire from the sky, mm -hmm. a, a time of darkness, and then, of course, there's Atlantis. Mm -hmm. And I never quite understood why people uh, of our age uh, would assume that everything that was written in high antiquity was just made up. Mm -hmm. I always thought to myself, this, surely this should come from somewhere, even if it's an interpretation, an adaptation, there has to be some kind of core to it. Yes, absolutely. I feel I feel the same way. I've always been I've always been mystifi mystified by the the speed with which mainstream historians and archaeologists simply dismiss uh, the oral testimony of the past, traditions that were passed down from by word of mouth from generation to generation. These are now treated as sort of folk, folk tales, legends, myths, and are, are not regarded as, as containing accurate content. Uh, and I, I, I've never understood that because actually they are the only memory we have for the time before our ancestors began to put down things in writing. In other words, before 5,000 years ago, all we have about the past of the human race is myths and traditions and folklore and the universal testimony of those myths traditions and folklore all around the world uh, is that we passed through a gigantic global cataclysm sometime in remote prehistory that it destroyed uh, an advanced almost godlike civilization um, and that there were survivors of this cataclysm who sought to pass on their knowledge to perhaps um, more economically simple people, hunter-gatherers who also coexisted in the world at the same time. As well as dismissing um, the, you know, the written and oral traditions, as you mentioned, there's also a tendency to dismiss the physical achievements. I mean, we see this, obviously, again, the most common example, best known example will be uh, the pyramids in Egypt, but mm -hmm. uh, you know you document countless examples all over the world um, of of things that were constructed in high antiquity, and it's kind of like, well, we've got no idea how they did it, but obviously mm. it was. I mean, I've seen some of the attempts to recreate mm. this, this mm. work, and that that's kind of kind of brushed aside, isn't it? Really, as well as as not significant. We don't know how they did it, but it couldn't have been anything. Well, more. look again, both in the case of the myths. And in the case of the hard physical evidence, the problem is that historians and archaeologists look at the past through a reference frame. This reference frame has been built up over the last couple of hundred years, not longer than that, and it claims that the human story goes something like this, that um, anatomically modern humans appeared about 200,000 years ago. Uh, for the next um, tens of thousands of years, right down to about 5,000 years ago. They did very little of note. Uh, and then after a, a slow development of one or 2,000 years, they began um, creating megalithic sites and building cities, and we see the spread of agriculture. So the story of civilization is really thought to be a story of the last 5,000 years. That's why myths which speak of a former civilization destroyed in a global cataclysm are ignored because they don't fit with the reference frame that historians view the past through. And it's the same reason why puzzling architectural achievements like the Great Pyramids uh, are not considered to be anything special because the point of view of mainstream history is that there is nothing special in the past. Just a long, slow, 
story of the gradual accumulation of skills and achievements. So the fact that the, the very best pyramids in Egypt are the oldest ones doesn't seem to bother uh, the keepers of our history because they've already decided how our history should be told and their project is simply to fit all the information into their existing reference frame. And new and challenging facts get dismissed for that reason. I often think about, uh, and I'm probably getting a little bit ahead of myself here in terms of what I wanted to talk about, but I often mm. think about how the future will regard us. And I've uh, always been very keen on architecture, and I note the degradation of building quality and design uh, going on around us. I mean, I've, I've lived in Victorian buildings. Um, mm. The building I live in now is 10 years old, and mm. the, the building quality couldn't be more marked. <laughs> yeah, we live in a period, in some ways, of devolution rather than uh, rather than evolution, and that has been the case in the past. I mean, I'm not sure what our civilization will leave to speak of in five or ten thousand years for, from now. Uh, there's no doubt that we're very technologically clever, uh, that we have um, achieved extraordinarily high levels of technology, but they're not accompanied by extraordinary high levels of wisdom. Uh, we do not incorporate the sacred uh, into our architecture in, in any way. The sense of, of, of connection with the universe, connection with spirit is missing from our architecture, and this is why so much mo modern architecture is not nourishing to the spirit. Rather, it's depressing, and it brings us down. Take the Great Pyramid. It's been my privilege to, to climb the Great Pyramid five times. Um, I've been in every known chamber uh, inside the Great Pyramid. I've, I've explored it thoroughly over the last 25 years. And it is, it is really a, 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 a structure that absolutely beggars belief. You know, we hear a lot of people mistakenly imagine that the Great Pyramid was built by slaves. This is one of the ideas which you see spread around in historical fora, and nothing could be further from the truth. First of all, there were no slaves in Old Kingdom Egypt, and secondly, the quality of workmanship on the Great Pyramid is so high. Actually, what you're looking at is a large team of master craftsmen at the absolute peak of their skills, working with dedication and commitment to complete this gigantic project, not the shoddy, half-hearted, reluctant work of slaves at all, but the way, work of masters and experts in their field. And this, of course, raises the question as to where that expertise was, um, was developed and, upon, uh, and, and the architectural principles upon which it rests. Where do they come from? How far back do they go? And to think that uh, 30 years ago in school I was being taught, uh, and they probably still are teaching, that the Great Pyramids were nothing more than tombs. I always thought that was a bit bizarre. Even as a child I thought, mm. surely not. That's a little bit too elaborate. Just Seems to be a lot of trouble to go to uh, <laughs> for, 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 a, for a burial. It, it does uh, rather. And, and uh, there are many other reasons to doubt that. For example, no body of any pharaoh has ever been found buried in any pyramid. There are more than 100 pyramids in Egypt, and none of them have yielded a contemporary pharaonic burial, a burial of a, of a, a pharaoh at the time that the monument was supposed to have been made. Sometimes people came along later and stuck bodies in them, but those are called intrusive burials. They're not, they're not actually to do with the original purpose of constructing the, 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 the project. And then we have uh, pharaohs like Sneferu, you know, who build more than one pyramid for themselves. Uh, all of these things raise doubts over the notion that the pyramids are tombs and tombs only. This has been the Egyptological view for, for many years. But if you're going to have something that's a tomb and a tomb only, then why make sure that it incorporates the dimensions of our planet on a scale of 1 to 43,200, which the Great Pyramid does? Or why align it perfectly uh, to true north within just three sixtieths of a single degree, as we find in the Great Pyramid. No, these these structures are much more complicated than that. And again, this is just an example of a reference frame in scholarship becoming so dominant that uh, new facts that challenge it cannot be cannot be studied anymore. Your book, your previous work, of course, has, has documented this as well, but the, the new book is just dripping with, it's a catalogue of, of countless coincidences across the globe, uh, whether it's from designs through mm -hmm. to construction methods, and it's, it's absolutely staggering, um, the, the, the number of 
things that you can catalog across the globe, uh, you know, right the way around, everywhere, north, south, east, west, yeah. things that were similar across vast spans of time. Yeah. And this is another thing that's kind of like ho-hum as far as uh, the mainstream is concerned. Yes, because it implies uh, a continuing tradition. Uh, which which is still which is still alive uh, to today, um, and because it is considering the story of the human past uh, in a completely different way from the way that that mainstream his, historians do, um, I I am very confident that we have lost a whole episode of the human story, and this forgotten episode, this lost episode, this lost civilization is very badly served by mainstream historians and archaeologists uh, who define what is taught to us about the past in schools and universities and who also define what is told to us about the past by the media. So there's a, my, my view is that there's a whole constituency of our past, a lost civilization which is not being properly represented um, by those who we entrust to tell us the story of our past. And that's why I've devoted many, many years to trying to tell the alternative story. Magicians of the Gods is an alternative look at history, looking at the evidence that the archaeologists don't want to consider uh, and setting it in context of the sometimes uh, dramatic story of our own planet. As a matter of fact, uh, cataclysms have played a key role in the evolution of life upon this planet. And why should we imagine that they have not also played a key role in the story of history? We know this, Graham, don't we, at a deep level? There's there's something that we've forgotten. I mean, I remember in the 1980s when I first read uh, Velikovsky, whatever limited information he had to work with, and I was only a teenager at the time, I remember just being struck uh, with something like, yes, yeah, I know this, I, we know this. It was almost like you then start to get into ideas of collective unconscious and psychology. Yes, yes. we know the truth when we see it. Um, Velikovsky was very far ahead of his time in, in anticipating and understanding the role of cataclysmic agents in the story of civilization. I don't think he was right on every, on every point, far from it. Uh, none of us ever are. Uh, this is a work in progress, uh, recovering our lost past. Uh, and I, I just hope that my book, Magicians of the Gods, and its predecessor, uh, Fingerprints of the Gods, that I published in 1995, um, are, you know, helping to provide those who are curious, those who are determined not to be misled by the mainstream, to provide them with ammunition and information to do their own work from. Since, I think, 2007, um, a great deal of evidence for your um, scenario has begun to emerge. And yeah. um, you, like a lot of other people, back when you published uh, the original book, were working with whatever information you had. But things have moved on apace, haven't they, in terms of physical evidence? Well, hugely. Uh, when I published uh, Fingerprints of the Gods in 1995, I was proposing that civilization is older and much more mysterious than we imagine. Uh, and I did focus on a window in time between 13,000 and 12,000 years ago, uh, when I believe that a global cataclysm cost us a whole civilization, which is now remembered only in myths and uh, traditions. But I didn't, I didn't really have the smoking gun. I, I didn't have a very specific, provable, demonstrable cataclysm between 13,000 and 12,000 years ago on a global scale that I could cite. So I looked at a lot of theoretical work. I was very interested in the notion of pole shifts and of earth crust displacement. Uh, and I, I don't uh, entirely rule those, uh, those scenarios out even now. But something else has happened uh, since I wrote Fingerprints of the Gods. And this is the main reason why I've gone ahead and written Magicians of the Gods, which is that we do have uh, a smoking gun now. We now know for sure that, that precisely that window between 13,000 and 12,000 years ago, and specifically 12,800 years ago, with a second series of events 11,600 years ago, precisely that time, the Earth was... Uh, the subject of a truly global cataclysm, what, what is referred to as an extinction-level event, an event that resulted in the extinction on a global scale of huge numbers of animal species. And that event 
uh, was the encounter between the Earth and fragments of a giant comet. Um, comets are mysterious things in a way, and they come into the inner solar system from the deep reaches of space, from places that astronomers refer to as the Oort cloud and the Kuiper belt. You have trillions of comets in the Oort cloud at a great distance from the sun, but occasionally gravitational disturbances will flip one of these off their distant orbit and plunge them into a, a, an orbit that brings them into the inner solar system and across the orbit of the Earth. And that's when, they, that's when they become dangerous. And comets have a habit of breaking up into multiple fragments. Anybody who was around and watching TV in 1994 will remember comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 and how it hit Jupiter. More than 20 fragments, giant fragments of comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 plowed into Jupiter in 1994, creating a huge cosmic fireworks show and great balls of fire uh, all over uh, the, the, the sphere of Jupiter. So um, if any one of those objects had hit the Earth, uh, by the way, instead of hitting Jupiter in 1994, we wouldn't be here having this conversation now. Uh, when you get objects that are several kilometers in diameter coming in at 70,000 kilometers an hour and hitting the Earth's surface, the, the effect is roughly equivalent to the entire nuclear arsenal of the, of the world being blown up at once. Um, and and this, is the, the, this is what is so dangerous about comets. Now, I need to cut a long story short. The scientific evidence on this is fully presented in Magicians of the Gods. But what it comes down to is that about 20,000 years ago, a giant comet with a diameter of about 200 kilometers entered the inner solar system and began to go into orbit around the sun on an orbit that crossed the path of the Earth twice a year. Um, that comet, like other comets, began to fragment. Initially, we have a 200-kilometer nucleus, and that begins to break up into multiple-sized objects, some of 5, 10, 20, 30 kilometers in diameter, and some of 2 or 3 or even 1 kilometer diameter. And, of course, smaller rocks as well are in the debris stream of this comet. And all that debris begins to, begins to spread out along the orbit of the comet, forming a huge... A tube-shaped highway of debris running around the solar system, which the Earth's orbit crosses twice every year. Again, I'm having to cut a long story short, but what the science indicates is that we collided with about eight fragments of that comet, leaving many more still aloft. We, we collided with about eight fragments of that comet 12,800 years ago. The epicenter of the impacts was on the North American ice cap. This was the Ice Age. North America, north of New York, was still covered with ice sheets more than two miles deep. The majority of the impacts were on that gigantic ice cap, and they resulted in a flood of icy water. As the ice cap was pulverized and melted, a flood of icy water poured into the Atlantic and the Arctic Oceans, disrupted the Gulf Stream and caused a sudden plunge in global temperatures that geologists now refer to as an episode called the Younger Dryas. That episode lasted for 1,200 years until 11,600 years ago, and then temperatures shot up again, almost to, 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 to today's level. Uh, and the calculations indicate that that was caused by a second encounter with more fragments of the comet. This time the fragments hit the Pacific Ocean and resulted in a huge uh, cloud of water vapor being thrown into the upper atmosphere, creating a greenhouse effect which caused the warming. We have evidence that we encountered further, further bits of this comet in the Bronze Age. The most recent encounter was in 1908, the Tunguska event, uh, which fortunately occurred in an uninha uninhabited area of uh, Russia. Uh, and we still cross the debris stream of this comet twice a year. So it's something that we should be, absolutely should be paying attention to even now. And it is something that has been interacting with the human story for close to 13,000 years. Something that lost us a whole civilization of prehistoric antiquity, uh, I believe. And that is responsible for the traditions of flood and fire and cataclysm that have been passed down to us 
by our ancestors. I mean, folks could go online and they can find photographs of the Tunguska event, and yeah. that object is like a marble compared to... Yes, it was a tiny object. It was probably not even 100 meters in diameter. Um, and it exploded. It was an airburst. It exploded at about five to six kilometers uh, above the ground. Uh, in the case of the cataclysms of 12,800 and 11,600 years ago, you're looking at much bigger objects than that, objects that are one to two uh, kilometers, in some cases perhaps even more uh, in diameter, like a, like a shotgun blast of, of um, huge pellets of buckshot that come pouring down, focused on the North American ice cap, but the, there were further impacts right across the Atlantic Ocean, impacts on the northern European ice cap, and impacts as far east as Syria 12,800 years ago. So this was truly a global event, and we no longer need to wonder what it was that could lie at the heart of all the myths and traditions of a lost civilization. We know the answer. It was this, uh, this terrible cataclysm that resulted from the impact of a comet, and it happened just yesterday in historical terms. You see, when I speak of the reference frame of historians and archaeologists and how this has become uh, so dominant that facts which, which don't uh, coincide with it are rejected, uh, part of that reference frame is that we needn't take any account of cataclysms in the story of human civilization. And I don't blame historians and archaeologists for that. These are disciplines that take a long time to build up to their conclusions. And until about seven years ago, we had no knowledge at all of the comet impact. Uh, it, was, it was hidden from us. It's only in the last seven years that the science has come out in mainstream journals like the Journal of Geology, like the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, like the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. This work has been, has been published in major, major, major academic journals. It, the general public are not yet fully aware of it, and that's why I have um, f featured it in a very important way in my book, uh, Magicians of the Gods. Historians and archaeologists are aware of it, but they haven't had time to build the new data into their model of our past yet. So they have created a model of our past which does not take account of an extinction-level event that happened right in the foundations of their model and therefore raises the possibility that everything that history and archaeology has taught us about the origins of civilization is in fact wrong and raises the possibility that uh, subjects like Atlantis which previously archaeologists and historians have mocked and laughed at anybody who was even remotely interested in Atlantis, well, we have to start taking uh, those traditions seriously now, uh, particularly since Plato put a date on the Atlantis cataclysm, uh, which was 9,000 years before the time of the Greek lawmaker Solon, who lived in 600 BC, which was therefore 9,600 BC, which is 11,600 years ago, which coincides exactly with the second of the two cataclysms at the beginning and the end of the Younger Dryas, the cataclysm of 11,600 years ago that saw massive global warming was also accompanied by a gigantic rise in sea level. So if Plato made the whole story of Atlantis up, as many of his mainstream critics claim, he was astonishingly uh, right and accurate as to the dating. One of the issues we have, of course, is that we collectively and ironically, particularly historians and archaeologists, operate over such a short span of time. You know, that we think that ancient Egypt, oh, such a long time ago, and indeed it was, but when mm. you zoom out and even yeah. consider, uh, the, you know, the age of a site, for example, like Gobekli Tepe, is one of the most exciting sites um, to be explored in recent years. I've had Robert Schock on here, Paul mm -hmm. Burley, Michael mm -hmm. Cremo, people like that, and they're all very excited about what that site is telling us. And yes. again, the book, you go over countless sites, but that's definitely one that you're very enthused about as well. Well, well Gobekli Tepe is, is very important to me, and I can say that, uh, that it and other sites like it are the other reason why I've written Magicians of the Gods. Firstly, because I now have the scientific evidence of the smoking gun, of the global, global cataclysm between 13,000 and 12,000 years ago. But secondly, uh, because archaeology in the last 20 years since I published uh, Fingerprints of the Gods has begun to reveal evidence of sites all around the world that cannot be explained by the mainstream model of history. And this is an embarrassment for archaeology. Uh, the, the, the site you've just mentioned, Gobekli Tepe, 
in Turkey uh, was uh, discovered and excavated by the German Archaeological Institute, and you can't get much more mainstream than that. Uh, what happened was that back in the, but again, the story of Gobekli Tepe helps us to understand the power of reference frames. Uh, because back in the 1950s, an American team were in Turkey looking for very ancient sites. And they found some, they went, to, they actually went to Gobekli Tepe, which was, then took the form of a hill, a small hill, a pot-bellied hill. That's actually what Gobekli Tepe means in the Turkish language. They went to Gobekli Tepe and they saw some flints lying on the ground. And then sticking out of the side of the hill, they saw the tops of a couple of very finely cut blocks. And when they looked at those finely cut blocks, they were so well done that the conclusion of this American team was that they were recent, that they probably were a medi they, were, they were probably looking at a medieval cemetery or something like that. So they abandoned Gobekli Tepe and didn't look at it again. And it wasn't until the mid-1990s when Klaus Schmidt of the German Archaeological in Institute came across their report and decided to take a second look at that site, that we discovered that those bits of blocks were in fact the tops of pillars sticking out of the ground. And those pillars uh, were put in place close to 12,000 years ago. In fact, 11,600 years ago, the same date that Plato gives for the submergence of Atlantis and the same date that we have for the sudden cataclysmic end of the Younger Dryas, the, the rise in global temperatures and the flooding that accompanied it. So it's intriguing that Gobekli Tepe also locks in to that date of 11,600 years ago. And here's the weird thing. Again, archaeologists have their reference frame. Our ancestors at that time are supposed to have been hunter-gatherers who had no knowledge of agriculture and certainly no knowledge of architecture. And yet here suddenly, close to 12,000 years ago, we have a site uh, emerging from the excavation which shows highly polished and skilled work with megaliths. There are uh, megaliths weighing 20 tons scattered around the Gobekli Tepe site and precisely aligned to north, south, uh, east and west. And lo and behold, at exactly the same moment, we get the evidence for the widespread um, uptake and distribution of agricultural ideas in Turkey in the same year. Area. So what mainstream archaeology now wants us to believe is that a group of hunter-gatherers woke up one morning and decided, perhaps they had an inspirational dream, they decided that they were going to create the world's first ever gigantic megalithic site, and it was going to be absolutely perfect, and also they were going to invent agriculture. And that seems to me uh, a really crazy idea, and it's forced on archaeology because it is an idea that fits the reference frame of archaeology. But if we include the possibility of a lost civilization, then something else completely begins to emerge. Then what we're looking at is not a group of hunter-gatherers who wake up one morning suddenly equipped to move 20-ton megaliths to organize themselves into a labor force and so on. What we're looking at is a transfer of technology that the survivors of a lost civilization settled in Gobekli Tepe, they already had the knowledge of how to make megalithic architecture, and they set about teaching the local inhabitants how to do that, and also taught them how to uh, develop agriculture as well. That makes much more sense of the whole extraordinary picture at Gobekli Tepe. And why do we know that Gobekli Tepe is 11,600 plus years old? Well, the answer to that is very simple. The mysterious people who created Gobekli Tepe, after they'd done with it, after they'd created this gigantic site, they buried it. They deliberately buried it. They covered it entirely in a mixture of rubble and earth that must have been brought to the site by teams of people literally carrying buckets and pouring them into the enclosures where the pillars stood and covering the pillars right up to their top and then over covering them and leaving us the, with this profile that was known in subsequent centuries as Gobekli Tepe, the pot-bellied hill. And underneath that pot belly, a time capsule waiting to be opened. And finally, it was opened in the second half of the 1990s. And now we have an archaeological site that truly is in the range of 12,000 years old, a megalithic architectural site. And you know what's so important about this? 
back in the 90s, when Professor Robert Schock and John Anthony West from Boston University presented the evidence that the Great Sphinx of Giza was 12,000 years old, based on its erosion characteristics, they were utterly rejected by archaeologists who said that this was impossible. Uh, of course, the Sphinx couldn't be 12,000 years old, the mainstream claimed. Uh, if it was, there would be many other sites around the world, megalithic sites that are 12,000 years old. And, and in the early 1990s, there were, there were none. Uh, but that's what's changed, because since the discovery of Gobekli Tepe, we now know that megalithic architecture was being done on a very precise and humongous scale, not very far away from the Sphinx. And if you can make Gobekli Tepe, then you can make the Sphinx. I enjoy your social media updates along the lines of stuff keeps getting older and of course we have the recently announced the so-called Stonehenge 2 and I just wonder as time goes on uh, time goes forward how much time will go backward um, who knows uh, you know I what... think it's go I think it's going to go backward a lot um, I mm -hmm. think we've all been held back by the rigid reference frame of mainstream history and archaeology and this is now going to have to change and I think we're going to have to look again at the ages of all megalithic sites, as a matter of fact. Uh, if we go around the Mediterranean, there are interesting megalithic structures on the island of Malta and on, and on Gozo. Uh, and there are inter interesting megalithic structures, for example, on the island of Menorca. Um, the Menorcan structures are T-shaped megaliths, visually identical to the Gobekli Tepe megaliths. Yet the Menorca uh, megaliths are only supposed to be three or four thousand years old, whereas we know that Gobekli Tepe is twelve thousand years old. I think that the reason is that the sites like Menorca and then also the Maltese sites, which are thought to be five thousand years old, but I also believe are much older, have been giving falsely young dates to archaeologists. And what I mean by that is that there is no objective technique to date the cutting of stone. It's important to be clear on that. When we talk about carbon dating, we are not talking about a, de a technique that tells us when a particular megalith was cut. Because carbon dating only dates organic material. It doesn't date stone. And therefore, what you want as an archaeologist is a piece of organic material that can be carbon dated in such close association to the piece of stone you want to date that you can conclude that they are from the same period. And this is possible at Gobekli Tepe in Turkey precisely because Gobekli Tepe was deliberately buried and then remained untouched by any other culture for more than 10,000 years after that, whereas the Menorcan megaliths and the Maltese megaliths have been in full view, have been tramped over by every and any later culture who may have deposited much younger organic material which may give a falsely young date to those sites. So I think we're going to have to consider megalithic sites as far away, not only the Mediterranean, but as far away as Tiwanaku uh, in Bolivia, uh, Easter Island also. Uh, we're going to have to c reconsider the dating of all megalithic sites in the light of what's happened at Gobekli Tepe. You're not an archaeologist, but it says something that your globetrotting efforts are bringing a lot of this to light. And I cover a lot of ground on this show, and in almost every discipline or area that I cover, if not all of them, there exists a mainstream. Yeah. And this is a major, major issue here because in one sense they exist where apparently, so it seems to us, you know, because they're the experts mm -hmm. and that's where the knowledge lies. And quite rightly, if you want to have your teeth fixed, you go to a dentist, you don't go to a mechanic, you know, some, yeah. you know someone who knows what they're talking about. But exactly. it, it, increasingly it seems it exists to be gatekeepers, controllers, uh, suppressors, and yes. I, I often wonder even what the thinking is among some of the mainstream, to be honest with you, you know, how much they are conscious of what they're doing and how much they themselves are, are deluded. I think the, we have to realize that ideology is at work in science, and, and ideology, by which I mean a, a, a preconceived set of ideas about how the past should be in archaeology and, and in history, have overridden the need to allow the past to speak to to speak for itself, uh, and this is what the mainstream is in um, in history in, in in history and archaeology. I often compare it to a very beautiful house built on foundations of sand, um, and as a result, no matter how beautiful the house is, 
it's going to fall down. Um, and, and by that I mean that really for the last, say, 8,000 years, uh, historians and archaeologists, I think, have got the, pi the picture pretty much right. Not all of it, but a good chunk of it they've got right. And I want to pay tribute to the fine, meticulous, detailed work that has been done by historians and archaeologists over the decades. But the problem is that they have evolved a model of history that does not take account of the extinction-level cataclysm that we now, happen, we now know happened between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago. And therefore, no matter how good the story of history has been for the last 8,000 years, the foundations of it, upon which it is built are insecure. The idea that uh, you talked about earlier, you know, that, that our ancestors were hunter-gatherers at a certain point and suddenly developed this knowledge, if we take your scenario into account, we then begin to tap into other, uh, we mentioned this earlier, this idea of common myths, this idea mm -hmm. of knowledge from the mm -hmm. gods, and then you start to talk about the Watchers and the Nephilim and these other myths and legends, and this knowledge coming from above, and this starts yeah. to make a lot of sense, you know, when your information is taken into account. Yes, I think it. I think it makes it makes a lot more sense. There has been a great deal of nonsense talked about the Watchers and the Nephilim um, by um, alternative historians as well as mainstream historians. Uh, I've done my best to set the record straight in Magicians of the Gods and and to show what these ideas are, are really all about and where they where they come from. But there's no doubt that our past is full of mysterious uh, episodes and unexplained phenomena. Uh, and I do try to get to grips with this in, in, the, in Magicians of the Gods. Well, of course, thinking about, as you say, you do a very good job, actually, of accounting for the legends of the Nephilim and the Watchers and what these um, entities, these creatures might actually have been, and it's fundamentally they were, they were human beings. I um, believe they were human beings. I, I think you have to torture the original material, the original source material. I think you have to really torture it to get aliens out of it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Which doesn't mean that I'm against aliens, you know. The universe is full of life. I just don't think that, I just don't think that ancient sites uh, are the best evidence for the uh, alien hypothesis, if you like. I think there's better evidence than that. And, and I, think, I think the ancient astronaut lobby is actually not doing a, a service to the cause of investigating other life forms in this universe by focusing so much on ancient historical sites which were definitely made by human beings. Um, do you get what I'm coming at? I'm not against the ancient, the ancient alien idea, but I don't think that our ancient sites are a good evidence for it. Yeah. I've spent 25 years roaming around the world. It's been my privilege to in investigate really a great many of the most mysterious and incredible ancient sites that have been put up anywhere, and not in not one of them have I found a piece of evidence that could only be explained by hypothesizing a spacefaring civilization, a civilization which had the capacity to cross interstellar space. Um, the level of technology that such a civilization would master uh, is far beyond anything that we see in the ancient sites. Even the Great Pyramid of Giza, which is truly one of the wonders of the ancient world, indeed it is the last surviving wonder of the ancient world, even the Great Pyramid of Giza has errors in its construction. The Great Pyramid is almost perfectly aligned to true north, but it's three sixtieths of a single degree off. Uh, the Great Pyramid's side lengths are almost exactly equal, but not quite. They vary by as much as seven inches along each side. Now, to me, this does not look like the work of a culture or a civilization that had the capacity to cross interstellar space. If you can cross interstellar space, your navigation is perfect. If you can reach this pale blue dot of the Earth across interstellar space, you can certainly, if you build the Great Pyramid, align it perfectly to true north, not three sixtieths of a single degree off, and you will certainly get the side lengths the same. So it's problems like this that make me say, I don't find evidence for ancient aliens in our most mysterious ancient sites. I find evidence for a lost human civilization. Well, I mean, I had a friend who bought a new build house a few years ago, and within a month the downstairs toilet stopped working so well. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> I all respect to the people who put together the pyramids. In mm. terms of um, knowledge from the gods, this idea, I mean, if we look at the Spaniards arriving in South America, 
and yeah. how they were regarded by the natives. It's easy to see how perhaps ancient peoples might regard um, other humans who arrived from somewhere else they know not where with this, so. ad this advanced knowledge. It's so. Uh, if I look back on the world of 13,000 years ago, just before the cataclysm happened, uh, it would be a world that was primarily inhabited by hunter-gatherers, but that also included a much higher and more advanced civilization, almost certainly uh, focused upon an island and upon coastlines just as the ancient traditions tell us. Now this may seem a surprising idea, but consider our world today. We have a highly advanced civilization, technological civilization on planet Earth today, but we also still have hunter-gatherers. We have hunter-gatherers in the Kalahari Desert, in southern part of Africa, in Namibia and Botswana, and we have, for example, hunter-gatherers in the Amazon jungle. Indeed, there are hunter-gatherers in the Amazon jungle that don't even know that our technological civilization exists. They haven't even been contacted yet. So the notion of hunter-gatherers and of highly advanced civilizations coexisting on the same planet is, is not absurd because it happens now. And that's what I'm suggesting happened in the past. And yes, if there were survivors of the cataclysm, if there were survivors of this advanced civilization, and they found their way, as many of the legends and traditions suggest, in ships to other lands and settled amongst the hunter-gatherers there, they might well have appeared to be the masters of godlike powers, the magicians of the gods. That's why I chose that title. Another major strand in your work is this idea of obviously one of the impacts, sorry, one of the consequences of the comet uh, impact was uh, the change in sea level. And, yes. Um, where the sea level is today is, of course, very different from what I mean. It's been up and down over the over the ages. Yes, um, but it's very clear uh, since the uh, since this um, cataclysm between twelve thousand eight hundred and eleven thousand six hundred years ago, sea level has risen by four hundred feet. Sea level all over the world has risen by four hundred feet. That means that 10 million square miles of land that were above water before the cataclysm are underwater now. Um, and again, how can we arrive at a full picture of our past when we never study those submerged lands? There is such a thing as marine archaeology, but marine archaeologists mainly look for shipwrecks. They don't look for the remains of a lost civilization. Why? Because their reference frame convinces them that there's no point in looking for the remains of a lost civilization, and thus it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. I was reading recently about Doggerland, but perhaps the most striking, and again, for folks out there, probably the best known example of this uh, is Easter Island. Um, mm. You look at this tiny little speck of land and then the huge sort of stone heads on there and other mm -hmm. um, other relics. And um, the, the official explanation, again, for that has always seemed preposterous. But when you factor in the idea of the sea level change, mm. and that this perhaps was um, a, you know the, the remnants of a civilization that existed when the sea level was much lower, once mm. again, the pieces start to fall into place. They, they start to fall into place. That's, ab that's absolutely right. Easter Island was part of a much larger archipelago before sea levels rose. Uh, and I and a number of my colleagues, Robert Schock, has been doing some very interesting work on Easter Island and on the sedimentation uh, around uh, Easter Island statues that are still in the quarry. Uh, and his work indicates that that sedimentation couldn't possibly have built up in, you know, 700 years, as mainstream archaeology claims, that we must be looking at thousands of years of deposition of sediment, and that this would make a whole lot more sense if we consider a time when Easter Island was a much larger landmass that was capable of providing the wind-blown and waterborne sediment that now covers those statues. One of the most delicious and intriguing things about all of this for me is that um, so many, I mean, some of these structures that we're talking about, and again, your, your book is just a, you know, a laundry list of them, um, mm. have some practical aspects, but so many of them don't. And mm. for me, this question of why, I think about the, you know, the, the figures on Easter Island. Yeah. Why did they make them? And this is, I, I, will we ever know? Can we ever know? But it's still there it is, you know. Yeah, so and I'm, intri I'm intrigued by the, I 
iconographic similarities between the Easter Island statues and the pillar figures from Gobekli Tepe, because those pillars in Gobekli Tepe, those megalithic pillars, are actually humanoid in, in form. The T-shape forms the head, and they have arms and hands that meet in front of the belly in exactly the same way uh, that we see on the Easter Island statues. Um, the, the, the question as to why these things were done is very difficult to answer. Um, I think that we're dealing with a culture very different from our own, with different motivations, um, driven, driven by very, very different things. Uh, today we are primarily interested in material goods and services. We're interested in production and consumption. Um, we live in a society that's ferociously competitive, that through the advertising industry seeks to persuade us that we should define ourselves in terms of our possessions. We are extremely materialistic in, in not, not only in the sense of being taught to love and worship material things, but also that we tend to neglect any non-physical or spiritual explanation of the mysteries of the of, 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 the, of the universe, you know. This is, this is how our society is. I think it was very different in the past. I think that I personally don't think that there, uh, I, I'm not a big fan of the, Ge the Great Pyramid was a power plant idea, that kind of thing. I, uh, there's some good work's been done on that, but it doesn't, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Um, I think the Great Pyramid was primarily built, was primarily built to influence and change human consciousness. Uh, it is still doing that today, uh, even deprived of its outer casing and of the whole cultural context in which it once stood. It draws people towards it like a beacon from all parts of the world. And if you're lucky enough to get into the so-called King's Chamber in the Great Pyramid alone, in silence, preferably in darkness, you can begin to feel this extraordinary monument speaking to you. It's as though it's loaded with data. And under the right circumstances, we can begin to, we can begin to download that data. I think the Great Pyramid is, um, is a device that uh, is designed to enhance human consciousness. And I think its role in the human race is not yet over. Quick side question here, get your thoughts on this. I'm very interested in sound, and I know uh, someone who's been and had that ex exact experience you describe uh, it, at the Great Pyramid. Also, I've, the BBC did something about sound with regards to Stonehenge, and I think that it was very, very significant to our ancestors. I, I agree. I, I think this is, again, one of the factors that we're not taking into account today. Um, because, frankly, because archaeologists and historians generally aren't very interested in sound, you know. It doesn't seem very interesting to them. They can't imagine why that would have mattered to our ancestors, so they don't look for it. But the moment you start looking for it, these ancient sites start communicating with us. Uh, the Great Pyramid of Giza is an incredible resonance chamber. Um, if you go up into the King's Chamber, uh, and have another person go all the way down 100 feet vertically beneath the base of the Great Pyramid into the subterranean chamber, and you have somebody up in the King's Chamber toning. I, I was once there with an opera singer who was singing in the King's Chamber while we were down in the subterranean chamber. You can hear it perfectly, crystal clear, through, you know, millions of tons of rock. It's, it's reaching you. There's incredible acoustic sophistication built into that. Uh, monument. There are accounts from ancient Egypt of priests uh, singing megalithic blocks into place. Um, we have similar accounts from the Andes in in South America and from and from Mexico as well. Um, and in in the twentieth century, there's an eyewitness report of Tibetan monks uh, levitating a, a substantial block of stone in the range of quarter of a ton, uh, about forty feet up the side of a cliff. Uh, using uh, sound again, using special kinds of horns that they that they blew into and created a, a vibration around this object. So I think I think it's pretty clear that there is an ancient technology involving the use of sound, and it has lapsed. We we are not masters of that technology anymore, and that's why we don't recognize it when we when we see it. It's very curious when you go down into the subterranean chamber beneath the Great Pyramid, which, as I say, is a hundred feet vertically beneath the base of the Great Pyramid, which is approached through a sloping corridor that's more than 300 feet long. 
When you get into that subterranean chamber, which is cut out of the bedrock, it's not symmetrical. There are, there are fins, literally fins of rock, standing up uh, on, on one side of it, out of the bedrock, left deliberately in place. And again, when I look at those, I can't help thinking that some kind of tuning uh, was being involved, some kind of tuning of the living stone to make this extraordinary monument resonate, resonate with that. So yes, sound is very important, and it's one of the things we're going to have to start researching if we're going to get to grips with you know, the next big question, which is what was the technological basis of this lost civilization. They could do things that absolutely beggar our imagination. We can't figure out how they did it, but they did it. So we need to get to grips with exactly how. And I think that sound will be one of the one of the ways that we do that. Well, exactly. I mean, talking about feats that beggar belief. I mean, I, I was reading about some of the stone blocks, you know, in the hundreds of tons. And, uh, you know, there's been people who've tried to recreate some of this work uh, mm. You know, particularly with an eye to like how they might have done it. You know, they've been using logs and ropes and all the rest of it, and a few hundred guys, and it hasn't worked out very well at all. Yeah. Uh, even on the planet today, if you wanted to move something like that, maybe somewhere I don't know, Russia, China, and the U.S. Maybe there exists a piece of uh, mechanized equipment that could maybe do the mm -hmm. job, but you not know, much. No. no, not much. It's at the it's at the edge of what we can do. I mean, I one of the sites that I visited while I was researching magicians of the gods and which I've written about extensively in the book, is Baalbek in the Lebanon. Um, Baalbek is an incredible site. And again, like many ancient sites, it confronts us with a confusing picture because the Romans were there. And the Romans built an undeniably Roman temple dedicated to the god Jupiter there. But that Roman temple is surrounded on three sides by a gigantic megalithic wall, which does not actually touch it or play any part in bearing the loads that the temple would have placed on the temple platform. Uh, and it's quite an enigma, this huge U-shaped wall, which includes the famous Trilithon at Baalbek, where we find three blocks, each weighing more than 900 tons, that were put into position more than 30 feet above the ground. And when we go to the quarries, we find three more blocks still in situ there, one of them 1,000 tons, one 1,250 tons, and the last one, which was just found last June, uh, 1,460 tons. And my view is um, that the Romans were not responsible for the megalithic work at Baalbek. They built their Temple of Jupiter within the embrace of that pre-existing U-shaped megalithic wall. And they didn't even know that further huge megaliths were sitting in the quarry. Uh, because if they had known that those megaliths were in the quarry, they would certainly have cut them up into smaller blocks, even if they themselves could not move them. Uh, I think they didn't find them because they were covered with sediment at that time, just as the block that archaeologists excavated last year was covered with sediment, in fact, until last year. Now, Graham, the very idea of catastrophism, of course, uh, meets with tremendous resistance from all the quarters we've been talking about. And, of course, there are reputations and grants and funding and all the rest of it at stake, but there's more to it than that. Why do we collectively seem to have such tremendous resistance to this notion? I think there's, um, there's a natural wish to, to deny that cataclysmic events are part of our story. Um, and, and we prefer... Uh, a cozy, warm feel of great security and no, and no immediate danger. Now, I'm not going around the world wearing a sandwich board saying that the end of the world is not. <laughs> that's not. That's not what I'm here to do. But the astronomers who've drawn attention to the Younger Dryas Comet and its cataclysmic effects 12, between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago also point out that we continue to pass through the debris stream of that comet twice every year. Uh, as we did in antiquity. Uh, we passed through it in June, the end of June, and we passed through it at the end of October and at the beginning of November. And that is a known meteor stream. It's called the Torrid Meteor Stream. And their calculations are that there are a number of very large and dangerous objects still hidden within the dust cloud of the Torrid Meteor Stream. And by the way, the Torrid Meteor Stream is 30 million kilometers wide and it takes the Earth 12 days to pass through it on its orbital path. Um, this is something not that should cause despair or fear or to cause us to shut our ears and our eyes. Uh, this is a problem that's within the technical capacity of humanity today to solve. 
Uh, all we have to do is behave in a loving and responsible way towards one another and towards this ma magnificent planet that the universe has gifted us with. If we drop all the fear and hatred and suspicion and all the wasted investment in weapons of mass destruction, the trillions that we spend every year on weapons of mass destruction, and focus instead on protecting this beautiful habitat for our children and our grandchildren and their grandchildren's grandchildren, then we'll be fine. We, we, we need not face a recurrence of the cataclysms that happened 12,800 years ago. But it's beholden to us. It's, it would be a irresponsible of us not to pay attention to this problem, particularly when we do have the capacity to do something about it. Yeah, indeed, you end your book really on this note, and you point out that in some ways that we do meet the criteria of the next lost civilization. Should we make the wrong choices? Yes, well, unfortunately, we do. You, you know, when you look at the myths and the traditions which speak of a former advanced civilization uh, being destroyed, um, you find that our civilization has a lot in common with those former advanced civilizations. Like Atlantis, you know, Plato tells us that once it was a beautiful and, and pure civilization de devoted to, to, to the arts and, and, and de devoted to the, the love of mankind, but that it became cruel, arrogant, and wicked as time passed. Uh, that it, in a memorable phrase, that the citizens of Atlantis ceased to bear their prosperity with moderation. In other words, they became too big for their own boots. And that, in that respect, I'm afraid we do sound a bit like the next lost civilization. Um, we, we, you, we need to change the way we behave, comet or not. Uh, the way the human race is behaving at the moment, the way we behave towards one another, this miasma of fear and hatred and suspicion that our governments and our big corporations deliberately uh, whip up, isn't good for us, and we need to change that anyway, whatever happens. But a byproduct of changing it and focusing on the real problems uh, would be that we could avoid uh, a further cosmic disaster, and that surely would be a desirable thing to do. Final point, Graham. Um, I saw your segment on the BBC Breakfast Show, I think it mm -hmm. was. Um, well done on getting so much information into such a short space of time. Thank, thank you. Yeah, I like doing live interviews with with mainstream news organizations because they can't edit me. <laughs> yes. um, the, I've, had, I've had a long experience of my words being taken out of context and what I'm saying distorted by others. So I was very happy to do a live interview with the BBC then and actually get to say what I, I wanted to say. Just closing thought really on your work and some of your colleagues and other you know, associates are trying to do the same thing and for the sake of humanity really. That those who say it can't be done should get out of the way of those who are doing it. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of people working in this field. I want to pay tribute to the team of scientists, um, James Kennett, R Richard Firestone, Alan West, Charles Kinsey, Ted Bunch, and, and many others uh, who for the last um, seven or eight years have been steadily, consistently, with great patience and thoroughness, presenting the buildup of evidence that proves we were hit by a comet 12,800 years ago and that it changed the world.